everyone, and welcome to your favorite YouTube series. And I'm starting to like it myself, not another demo. Uh, this is episode 19. We've made it all the way to 19. Um, as you all probably know by now, uh, and if you don't, go watch the first 18 episodes. Not another demo is where we have a real honest conversation with a vendor. Um, the, the, the rules of engagement here, no PowerPoints, no marketing jargon and no acronyms. If you use one, we're gonna ask you what that means. And if I use one, um, certainly um, you can ask me what it means as well. Uh, we are thrilled today to have with us Joseph Salazar from Ativo Networks. Uh, we are going to be talking about what I think is critical um, stuff right now is lateral movement and privilege escalation, part of almost every conversation that I'm a part of. So, um, so Joseph, welcome. Uh, to not another demo. And I, so everyone else that's watching is probably like, why is it only two people? So last week, I left the guys hanging because I had some construction going on at my house. Um, today, they all left me hanging because they've got um, meetings. So anyways, it's uh, this is going to be a super fun conversation. Joseph, with that, I'll have you introduce yourself and Ativo Networks a little bit. Um, the first question I always like to start off with is, you know, we're, we're in a world we're still mostly virtual. That means people feel like they can put endless amounts of meetings on our calendar. Um, so I think all of us are maybe as busy or busier than ever. Why would someone uh, want to carve out, say, a half an hour or an hour of their day to talk with Ativo Networks? Well, so let me start with uh, the company as a whole. We've, we've actually been around for uh, a pretty long while where uh, we started shipping product in, in 2014. And and initially, it started off as, as just detecting um, movement. Um, the company, uh, we like to say now, is we are the experts in lateral movement detection and uh, privilege escalation prevention. So we detect and prevent lateral movement and privilege escalation, which, as you said, is the part of pretty much every type of attack that's happened. If you think of every major breach in the past five, seven, ten years, they've had aspects of lateral movement and privilege escalation. Every single one that was devastating. Uh, name it, it's probably had an active directory component, it's had privilege escalation component, it had something that the that could have been detected if they knew what to look for, if the organizations knew what to look for. And just about every single um, attack has a lateral movement component because you're as an attacker, you're never going to find the golden goose on your first compromise system. You're yeah, never right. going to find it. So they have to move around. And so what we looked at, we looked at the problem differently, right? And we're, we're a threat detection company. Um, and we looked at the problem differently. We, we thought about it in terms of, we know the attacker is going to get in. They've proven that they can get in time and time again. All it takes is a careless click on a link or opening the wrong email or going to the wrong website and you've been compromised. So they've proven they can get in. And prevention solutions are great at what they do. They are, they absolutely are. All of your, your perimeter prevention, your EDR, your EPP, those are great solutions but attackers can still find ways to evade. And once they get inside, that's the big blind spot inside network security. No one looks at internal traffic as closely as they do the traffic that's hitting their external interface. And so we thought about it and said, you know, attackers need to move around. They need to do privilege escalation. Why don't we create a technology that can find them? And there was some existing sort of mechanisms in place that used to do that right? And, and, but they weren't very effective. And so we found a way to make them effective, right? So when you look at Ativo Networks, most people think, oh, you're a deception technology provider. No, we're a threat detection company. We just happen to use deception as the method that we use. Okay. And, and we go well beyond just the, the typical deception space, right? Yes, we create decoys. Yes, we create fake credentials, but we go well beyond that. We've actually expanded now to the point where we don't, we, we look at, at, at deception as the mechanism, but what we really do is we're looking at protecting identity, right? But we do it a different way. We look at it in the sense of, okay, we know attackers are going to access Active Directory. We know attackers are going to steal credentials that are locally on the system. We know attackers are going to move around laterally to find their targets. So we look at it as a way to stop the attacker once they've gotten in, but before they've gotten anything useful. So we detect attacks yeah. in the reconnaissance and discovery phase. We look at all the lateral movement, the credential theft, the privilege escalation, and the data collection. And that is why you should be talking to Ativo. Yeah, so, so a, a couple of things I wanna unpack there a little bit. One, I love the fact that you're talking about 
the the identity and the credentials because I've been an Active Directory person since Active Directory, and you know, I, I as we have continued to evolve, and I see um, you know uh, uh, solutions around all these different places. I I, I, I sometimes feel like I have to keep telling people, but it's about the identity, right? The, this is what they're trying to get. So we spend a lot of time and energy talking and, and protecting other things and then, you know, leaving what they're actually trying to get at unprotected. And yes. so I'm glad to hear that you guys are, are looking at that because I do feel like that is a very critical component. Um, the other thing that, that you mentioned and when we start talking about lateral movement, one of the things that I find um, fascinating with um, with, with hackers and, and attacks right now is the amount of patience that um, hackers will have. It's it's no longer like I'm gonna you know hit you with a denial of service or I'm gonna try to breach your firewalls and get something and get out of there before you can find me. You know I, I'm seeing you know some of these breaches taking months and months where where people are are being very patient about what they're doing. So can you talk a little bit um, from a, a Nativo standpoint about, um, I think one, what you guys can do to, to maybe stop someone from getting in in the first place and sitting there for months. But also, I guess, you know, how, how do you help prevent maybe someone that is inside uh, that's, that's taking a long, like, how do you find those things? Does, does that make, does that question make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. So, so, so we, we like to, to, to point out a stat called dwell time. Um, last year, dwell time actually went down. It, it, it's still over two and a half months. Uh, but dwell time is defined as the, the time from when an attacker gets inside and establishes a presence in the network to when you actually find them. Two and a half months. You know what I can do as an attacker in two and a half months? Amazing. <laughs> Inside right? your network and detected, right? So, so what we do is we we don't try to work in the space that other prevention solutions do. They, like I said, they do a great job. A lot of our partners are prevention solutions, right? Th they handle 90 something percent of the attacks that are going to hit you and they're going to stop them, right? It's those advanced attackers, the sophisticated actors who know what they're doing, who can get in. Those are the guys we're looking for because an attacker has to do something once they get onto, let's talk about a typical attack cycle. The attacker is going to get in via something like social engineering. Once they get onto that system, they're gonna do a few things. They're gonna conduct reconnaissance um, throughout the network. And when I talk about reconnaissance, I'm not talking about doing ping sweeps. No one does ping sweeps, they're too noisy. I can get enough information from Active Directory and from the local system to identify all of the other systems that I need to target. And I can, you know, as, long, as soon as I can start jumping to them, I can identify more systems. And pretty soon, I'll have a better map than the network administrator of the network without having to establish uh, any kind of pink sweeps. I just have to find systems. And I can do that by stealing the local credentials, looking at what's stored on that local endpoint, and then querying Active Directory for things like service principal names. If I want to find out all the HTTPS servers in your environment, I can do that because Active Directory is going to have that. Right. Active Directory is the, is the GPS and the authentication and authorization mechanism for your entire network. It's a directory service. So it's going to have everything I need. So why do I have to do anything else super active? I'm on an Active Directory domain joint system. I can query Active Directory. That's how it works. So as an attacker, I'm going to do all of this before I even take my first step out of your out of that first infected system. Gather as much data as I can, and I can be as patient as I need to be. Because as soon as I start moving, that's when I start becoming vulnerable. So what we at Ativo do is we target the attacker at his most vulnerable. From that initial query to Active Directory, we can interrupt it and insert fake, fake credentials in its place. When he starts looking at items inside that endpoint, we can hide sensitive and critical files, folders, network shares, map shares, cloud shares, even removable storage. We can hide those things so that the attacker doesn't see anything useful. And if we're querying Active Directory and relying on Active Directory to get most of his data, and he doesn't realize that he's getting fake information that leads him to someplace else other than production systems, then he's not going to have an effective attack. If you interrupt the attacker during his most vulnerable phase, which is the discovery and intelligence gathering phases, during that reconnaissance phase, everything downstream gets disrupted as well. So right? let me see. Yeah. So let me see if I'm understanding this um, correctly. So 
And I, I love how you talk about people being able to get in, right? I, I don't care what your defenses are. People are going to be able to get in. I, you know, there's always this, I've heard this battle lately too, of like, you know, red team versus blue team. I think red team has it super easy. They, they just got to find one little hole. Blue team's got to try to plug everything that they don't even know is out there. So um, for all you red teamers out there, get off your high horse. Your job's a lot easier. Um, but uh, so, so we have someone that's on the inside. And so if I'm, if I'm, catching this correctly when they're when they're most vulnerable is when that lateral movement starts to happen mm -hmm. so if your technology is um is when they start making that lateral movement they're going to some something that's not real right to this decoy that's when you can catch them making that move because they're attacking something that we know they shouldn't or going at something we know that they shouldn't and so that makes them even more vulnerable to being caught. Am I am I catching that correctly? Yeah. So so let me let me let me back a little bit, just sort of explain how you would do something as well. So so a little bit of background about me. I've I'm been uh, tech, um, an information security practitioner for over twenty years, both in the military side and civilian side. I'm actually a retired major. My last eight years was in cybersecurity, um, but my first uh, sixteen or uh, fourteen years was in military intelligence and counterintelligence. So when I got into the deception space, it made a lot of sense to me because it's all about intelligence gathering. It's all about foiling intelligence gathering. So when we create uh, this, um, you know, when you deploy a TiVo, say you deploy the entire fabric, right? Um, we start with Active Directory. You're, we're going to do things to protect Active Directory and that's identifying the sensitive or critical objects within Active Directory that you wanna protect and then creating facsimiles that look like them in, and that we return to the attacker if the attacker queries Active Directory. Uh -huh. And then we do that data cloak function where we hide things on the endpoint and we hide things within Active Directory so that the attacker never actually sees those sensitive and critical objects. And then we can create a decoy environment where we have servers that are full VMs that look just like your regular systems. We can customize them however we want, make them look exactly like the systems on every single VLAN you've got because the goal of that decoy is to blend in. It's not to stick out. Right. right. So that when an attacker lands on that, he can't tell the difference between the real production asset and the decoy we've got in place. And the really cool part about those decoys is that they record everything that happens. So when the attacker, say, queries Active Directory, we insert accounts and results that point him to, to, to non-production systems, decoys, right? Yeah. Because a decoy has no production value. No one should be touching it. And so if anyone touches that decoy, it's automatically destroyed. You know it's so. Like so when he gets on that decoy, we record everything he does. Now, not only are you understanding what he's doing, you're seeing what he's targeting, you're also collecting all of those IOCs, you're developing TTPs. So we call we like that company-centric threat intelligence. You're not developing intelligence by getting a feed from somebody else. You're developing intelligence about from, from the attack that's actually happening inside your environment at that moment. Huh. And so if you put all of these things together, now you're interrupting the attacker, right? So you're denying his ability to access sensitive and critical objects. You're detecting him during his reconnaissance and, and other lateral movement activity, credential theft, discovery, anything. And you're derailing the attack to something that doesn't matter because you can always reset a decoy. So now, okay. So now what happens when, let's say uh, somebody goes to the decoy and what's what's the like I got you mechanism right is that something that you guys are doing inside of a TiVo or is this hey something's happening I'm sending this to my sim or alerting my sock or what well, like what does that step of the process look like okay so let's 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 go through those steps of attack okay I am attacker I get onto an endpoint I steal some credentials some of those are going to be fake but I'm not going to know that I'm going to query active directory some of those results are going to be fake but I don't know that right when I start to move around if as soon as I did that query to Active Directory, bing, an, an alert went off somewhere, okay. whether okay. it's our dashboard or the SOC. So gotcha. that query generated an alert. So now they know that someone is querying Active Directory. Now, if they follow the credentials that they stole yeah. or, or they, they follow a credential that they queried from Active Directory or they even touch, say like uh, they queried for um, domain controllers from Active Directory because directory, you know, NL test slash DC list is going to list every domain controller inside the environment, right? Yep. And then, you know, DS get DC is gonna tell you which one you're connected to. If they go to that server, if they try to ping it, they're actually pinging a decoy because those are things that we can hide. And now mm -hmm. we know that there is someone doing reconnaissance and discovery inside the environment. 
when they try to follow and go to that system and connect to it, now we're generating alerts. Hey, they've connected to the decoy. But so you see that sequence of events from the very, very first moment that they started to look around, we've already detected them. We've already generated an alert. Now, yeah. the really cool part is we can alert from our dashboard or we can send it to the SIM, yeah. uh, you know, and they can get that from their single pane of glass. And even better, within two clicks on our interface, you can actually quarantine that attacking endpoint, either natively through our own technology or with any one of our 40 or so partners that can do um, uh, isolation, network isolation or quarantine. So you can immediately respond if you want to, or you can let the attack play out because there's value in letting the attack play out. Hmm. Because as the attack is attacking the that that non-production system, you're collecting all that threat intelligence. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that that's so that's interesting because that takes it. I mean, that takes it beyond, right? And then the, now you're now you're gathering information versus just stopping an attack from happening. So yes. Um, so okay. Uh, it's, it's great stuff. Um, so I I talk to a lot of people, and when they think about lateral movement, they think about user behavior analytics. Um, so can we talk a little bit about like? Um, if, if someone says, I don't need a TiVo, I've got a UBA in place, um, can we, let's have a little bit of a conversation about you kind sure. of versus or alongside of a UBA type of solution. Yeah, well, first of all, um, our solution isn't meant to displace any other solution. We work well with all of them, right? Our, our goal is to provide additional early visibility to in-network attacks, right? So let's talk about UBA. UBA is designed to create a baseline of behavior for every user account in the environment and then identify when that behavior strays. So it's really anomaly detection. When that user behavior um, strays from the established baseline within a certain set of parameters, right? So you're looking for anomalies in that user's activity. Where that can stumble, right, is if the attacker doesn't do anything to stray beyond that typical user behavior. If I um, create a, um, a behavior profile for a user in finance and all that user does is access things within finance and that user's account gets, gets compromised and all they do is access things in finance. Yeah. You're not gonna detect them right away, right? Um, now, there might be some behavior that if you're, if you're really tune your UEBA technology well, you can identif identify as potential anomalous behavior, like who does a ping, right? As a regular user, are you gonna sure. pull up command line and do ping, right? So that would be something that you could, you could create as a, as, as a deviation from baseline, right? But again, attackers don't often ping anymore. Everything they need, they can do by creating yeah. Active Directory. So now you're going to have to get deeper. What if I create rules that if someone runs the NL test applet and with a flag DS get DC, then I'm going to flag them. Okay, great. That'll work as well. But what if it's a, uh, an administrator that's authorized to do that? You're right, right. right. So, so, so I was so going to ask that question. Yeah, let me let me jump in just because I was so I was going to ask that question because I think you think you might you might know this a little bit. So, uh, I mean, I, I I use the like we build a better mousetrap, they build a better mouse analogy all the time. So, are are you seeing that uh, attackers when they come in and they get credentials, are they are they understanding what those credentials can do so that they can move around without being noticed by those things? I mean, has the level of attack gotten, is it, is it that sophisticated now in some instances? So back in DEF CON 24, there was a talk called Six Degrees to Domain Admin. And that talk introduced a, a um, application called Bloodhound. Are you familiar with Bloodhound? A little bit. So Bloodhound, what it does is it queries Active Directory and it creates a map of user objects and permissions. And yeah. the idea is to find the shortest path to get what are called overlapping permissions and eventually escalate to domain administrator privileges. Okay. So if I if I run Sharpound, which is the backend engine for Bloodhound, and then I use it to create a map in Bloodhound, I know every single user account and I know what their permissions are and I know where they can go and what they can touch and, and then all I have to do is look for objects that fit within that environment and I'm staying well within the UEBA parameters. Yeah, I'm only touching yeah. things I'm authorized to touch. So yes, attackers have gotten that sophisticated. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I think to me, that's, that's one of the things that I've been talking a lot about lately is, you know, we, we have to understand that the, these, these attacks, even, even against smaller organizations have become incredibly complex. And this isn't necessarily like someone sitting in their mom's basement with a hoodie on, like we've, you know, we thought of, these are people going into an office and working their nine to five as being a hacker. So, you know, their, their patience, again, I go, I go back to that word, the patience of the, the hacker is amazing to me at this point. So, yeah. Well, if you think about, if you think about where the threat actors are now, right? So you've got, you've got a lot of different layers when it comes to, to you know, tiers of, act, of threat actors, right? The lowest tier is going to be those script kiddies, the ones who find something interesting and they try it out. They're not really super sophisticated. They don't, may not have any training or they might only be somewhat self-taught, right? Um, you know, uh, Next Gen Hacker 101 comes to mind, right? Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, th th they don't really know what they're doing. They're just playing around with a toy. That's like handing the keys to a, uh, you know, a Dodge Hellcat to a 16-year-old uh, who just got his license, right? Right. All this power, absolutely no idea what to do with it. No idea what to do with it, yeah. And then you've got the folks who've done some sort of training and, 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 and sort of understand and maybe have a little bit of experience. They might have become, you know, they might be security professionals who are trying to teach themselves. They're, they're the learning phase, right? That's your tier two. And then you have the, the professional attackers, right? The, the, the pen testers, the red teamers, the guys who, make, who, who really understand how this works. And then you have the state level actors, the ones who are, back by have a lot of resources they they you know and and i and i put i'll put criminal syndicates in here as well right because not all yep. attacking activity is about stealing secrets it's about making money yep. right and so and, and there are actually threat actors that will moonlight they'll they'll on their in their government job they'll steal state secrets and then, then in their criminal job they're going to monetize those secrets to make money right some other way uh so so th there uh, the more sophisticated the attacker the more sophisticated you have to be to try to defend them, right? Which is why it's somewhat trivial for a tier two and a half, tier three hacker, attacker, because I dislike the term hacker. Hackers are actually, it, it, it has a, a, a different connotation for where, where I come from. Sure. Attackers, attackers tend to, you know, at two and a half, at level two and a half and higher, they can get in at will, right? So it's really more a question of how fast they can get in and how long they can be there before you can find them. Right. And so, so for, for a threat actor that's sophisticated enough to get into your environment, they're sophisticated enough to stick around for a while. They're going to be sophisticated enough to look around and find your crown jewels, your, your key critical systems that they can take down and then ransom for, right? They're, the, you know, think about the solar winds attack. That is an extremely sophisticated attack. Right mm -hmm. to establish a supply chain vulnerability that cascades to almost eighteen thousand organizations potentially. Yep. That that is a very sophisticated actor. But you don't have to be at that level to compromise an uh, uh, a uh, an organization. You just have to be good enough to bypass them. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. It's like that. I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than faster the person than next to me. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so um, another thing that I hear sometimes, and I want to ask this question of you, because I think I'm fascinated to hear your answer to it is I, I do hear some organizations that are like, I don't really have anything. I don't really have to be worried. We're a manufacturing company or we're a this company, that company. Can you, Talk to me from an attacker standpoint. I mean, obviously there are some that, that maybe would have, you know, the treasure chest might be huge, but does when, when an attacker is looking for someone to attack, are they that worried about what that company is or more just how easy it is to get into it? Well, that depends again on those tiers of, of attackers, right? So, so attackers, there, there's what's called a pre-engagement phase to every attack. And that's when they're going to gather as much, they're going to choose a target and they're going to gather as much information as they can about that target, right? If you get into the crosshairs of a, of, of a determined, sophisticated attacker, you are going to get compromised. There's just no way around that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, when I did when I did close close action um, penetration testing, I would walk in and I could I would be like the UPS guy. I would be a delivery guy or, or a messenger or someone delivering flowers. And, and it wouldn't take long for me to social engineer to get in there somehow, right? There's ways for an attacker to get in and they don't even have to be close action anymore, right? When I did this, it was like you know, 15, 20 years ago, yeah. 10 years ago. 
you don't have to even do that anymore. You don't have to step foot in the building. Everything is available in the cloud. Everything's available remotely, right? So, so attacking an entity has gotten easier. So, so it's not a matter of, can I get in? Because for an attacker, yes, they can get in. It's not, you know, there's no ease or hardness to do it. It's just how much more time do I have to take to get in, right? So, so if you've got, even a small organization is going to have something valuable, even if it's their customer data, even if it's an active director, hey, I'm going to put you out of business unless you pay me X. And the, then the question is sizing X where it's more profitable to pay you off than it is for them to close up shop, right? So, yeah. so it's just, so it just, again, it depends on the sophistication of the threat actor. It depends on how high they want to set their sights on, right? I mean, there are some big elephant hunter attackers out there. And there are some whale hunters out there, right? You've got big game hunters that go after the biggest of the big organizations, like Solar Winds and U.S. government and you know banks, right? And you have other guys that are going to try, like they're not, they may not have as much backing, they may not have as much infrastructure. I mean, they may not have the means, but they can still make money off of cybercrime. And so they're going to do things. They're going to steal your, I mean, because your data, like. Uh, your email address, getting harvesting a, an organization's email addresses, that's something you can resell on black market, on the dark web, right? There's no piece of data that can't be monetized in some way. So it doesn't matter your size, you can be a target. I'm so grateful that you said that. Are you listening out there, audience? <laughs> Someone else is, is saying that besides me. No, I, I appreciate that because I do think, you know, I think people have to realize that, you know, even if you're, you know, you're not the, some huge bank or something, right? You, you do still have data that's valuable and you may think that you're secure. So maybe you're focusing on some of this stuff less that just makes you easier pickings. And actually here in Michigan over the last couple of years, we have seen instances where um, companies have just folded up shop in some smaller organizations that got hit with a ransomware and the owners were just like, you know what? I'm out and closed up the door. So that does happen. Well, so let me ask you a question, right? So, so you know, you go to a doctor, right? Do you yeah. have a, a personal care physician? Does he have his own office? Does he have his own practice? Mine is part of a bigger practice, but yes. Yeah, right. So imagine if he gets compromised. How much data, can you imagine the, the, the amount of money you can make as a threat actor by compromising a small doctor's practice or an accountant? Right. Those are small businesses, but imagine the type of data they hold or a small two partner law firm, right? There is no business. Yeah. There is no business that is small enough that an attacker can't monetize the data they pull from it. And I think, you know, some of the other numbers that I've seen was, you know, someone, the attacker, he maybe doesn't need to make a million dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year. They may live in a place where ten thousand dollars a year gives them a pretty good lifestyle. And if they can do that by picking off some smaller companies, you know, then hey, the, well, the finance the, the the financial uh 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 motivation that's the word motivation is there, right? Well, yeah, I mean, think about the 419 uh, scammers, the Nigerian scammers, right? They're not making millions of dollars off of these small scams but they're making enough to live well in their community. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Right, so that's which fast. is why they keep doing it. And for them, it's the shotgun approach. Approach. How much spaghetti is gonna stick to a wall if I throw this plate at it? Those things that stick is where I'm gonna make my money. Yeah. Right? Yep, yep, exactly. God, this is good stuff. I like well, it. Well, and, and, and then even think about it this way, right? So, so there is a market of criminal activity. You can buy and sell criminal activity. You want a money mule that can extract money from a bank that you've done a bank scam on? Great. You can hire them on the dark web. You can hire them as quote unquote subcontractors on something like WeWork or something like that. You know, like one of those, yeah. those, those uh, you know, typical uh, contract uh, web boards, like even Craigslist, right? There are ways to, to make and monetize the entire criminal ransom process where you're subcontracting everything. You don't have to be a mastermind criminal. You just have to hire the right people to make the money for you and they just get their cut. If at the end of the day, you make a million dollar scam and you pull home $500,000 and the rest have gone to your subcontractors, that's still a good day. It's a pretty good day. Right? That's still a good day. <laughs> so I can hire someone to create a, to, to, 
to create a piece of malware off of a zero day that they bought from somebody else. I can hire somebody else to do a distribution campaign for spam. I can hire somebody else to, uh, to organize their mule network to pull money out once I've done my scam. I can do all of these things and subcontract everything. And that is the criminal economy. Yeah. Isn't that something fascinating? Huh. So let's, let's, let's bring this all back to a TiVo network. Some of the stuff that I like to talk about in these are, you know, what is the process of doing like proof of concept or how, let, let's talk implementation a little bit, how difficult or easy is that? Um, things like, you know, because because I get asked these questions a lot. Well, do I need to hire a person to manage this? And how long is it going to be before it's deployed? So let's talk for a few minutes just about like working with the TiVo networks and sure. what that looks like. All right. So uh, for for a, a um, typical um, deployment, right? Um, normally, you would you would contact one of our our, um, our sales reps, you know, the sales execs, and um, have a conversation about sizing it for your needs, right? If you're a shop with a thousand endpoints, you're not going to need an enterprise box that can handle a global organization, right? So we're gonna size the solution for you. We're going to give you, and, and then it also depends on your risk profile and the particular needs that you're going to, you, you're going to want to meet, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about lateral movement and privilege escalation, right? So say you have a small active directory shop, you have you know maybe 5,000 um, uh, endpoints and, and, and uh, uh, about you know you know half of that are, are, as users right because you're always going to have more endpoints and users. Um, say you you're concerned about things like ransomware and things like that right. So we can size the package for you, and then once you've you've had that discussion with with the the, the representatives and and come to an agreement on in terms of how you're going to do things, we'll set up the POC. And here's the really cool part about it: the POC really is a, is about establishing your requirements, right? So we've got the requirements in place. We're going to install the box and we can actually even, most, most of, a lot of our sales now actually happen without a piece of POC, but we can set up the box, have it auto learn and have you deployed in about two hours. Nice. So the box will automatically learn your environment and custom craft the decoys and the credentials um, so that you can get up and running right away. And, and then it'll just give you a list of the proposed de deployment. You can approve it. You can make any customizations that you want. You can add additional things from the template and then you're set. And then you can um, deploy the endpoint components, which is things like the, the credentials and, and the, uh, the Active Directory security function, which all happens at the endpoint. The really cool part about all of our Active Directory stuff is it happens at the endpoint. It never touches the domain controller. So it's very easy to deploy because you don't have to worry about dealing with the IT department to deploy something on an AD controller that you yeah. that they're afraid, you know, anything that gets put on it is gonna get screwed up, right? Um, and then you let it work. I mean, it's, it's, it's up and running, it works. And then if you want to, you can start running tests against it. I've done POCs in as little as a day. Yeah. I run all the attacks. I show them everything that it's detecting. I can even do like a fake ransomware attack where I encrypt a bunch of stuff off of the fake drive. And then you see that it just keeps encrypting and encrypting and encrypting, all these things that you can do and we call that a proof of value because really you're seeing the value of the product because it works, yeah, yeah. right? We know that it works and, and we'll even give you contacts to peers in your, in your you know, customers that are peers of, in your industry. You can talk to them, ask them questions, get their feedback. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to help you make that decision even before you even to get to the POC stage. And like I said, a lot of our, a lot of our um, engagements with customers, a lot of people, a lot of organizations become customers without needing a POC because we can prove the value before they even have to see it. But for those that require to see the brand, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, we can do that as well. And, and really what we like to do is we like to do what's called a managed POC because that POC box can end up becoming your first deployment. And I was just going to ask that question, yeah, actually. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And then even, even more than that, we have a very strong professional services group that will help you with strategy. It'll help you with deployment, customization, and help you troubleshoot things. And they will call you occasionally just for like a get well check to see, hey, how are things going? Is there things that we need? So we are very active. We want to make sure that the customer is successful. We care about the customers we have, right? I mean, globally, we have over 300 customers now, and that's pretty good for a startup. Um, you know, we... We want to make sure that our customers aren't buying shelfware. We want them to use it. We want them to gain value from it. And we want them to see how effective it can be. And then as they want to, as they decide to expand that deployment and maybe add a few more things or the new products and solutions that we introduce, right? They've got that, that um, they've got the knowledge and they've got the, the comfort zone 
where because of the way we've engaged with them, where they know we're going to take care of them throughout the entire the process. Yeah, to me, that is super important and one of the areas. So I'm glad to hear you saying that because I do think one of the areas that that vendors lose sight of is that post sales process and that continued engagement with the customers. Um, you know, most of the time when I see somebody taking a product out of their environment, it's because they got bad customer service or they weren't getting enough out of it or, or that sort of thing. So I um, appreciate that, uh, that, that you guys do that as well. So, um, so this I think this one could go on forever. Um, this is an awesome conversation, um, but uh, uh, we'll we'll cut it off because um, you know. Anyways, uh, so <laughs> Joseph, this was a super interesting conversation. I, I really appreciate you having it with us. For anyone that's watching this, uh, like tomorrow when or today when I get it out, um, Ativo Networks is going to be sponsoring our event next week, which is like sold out and we can't wait for it. Um, for, uh, I guess I always have to throw in the like uh, subscribe and like and all of comments, leave some comments, all that sort of fun YouTube stuff. So again, Joseph, I really am grateful for you spending this time with me and sharing some of your knowledge. Fascinating discussion and uh, we will see everyone uh, for episode 20. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much for having me.